afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly at 3 p.m. For those of you who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While waiting, we would like to share with you a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles, and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on a bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website and we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk entitled Legal Aspects of Digital Transformation. My name is Cassandra Tomasios. I'm a partner with Mawing Kwai and Associates, and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's talk, let me introduce the firm and what we do. Mawing Kwai and Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Dr. Ma Wing Kwai. Our ABLE team today comprises 24 lawyers and a support team of 19. Dr. Ma is today a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal bench in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with SMEs, family businesses, and individuals. We are a full-service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, which includes litigation, adjudication, and arbitration, a dedicated employment industrial relations team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of our MWKA online talk series. By way of background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were broadcasted live. But with the COVID-19 MCO, we have moved online in order to continue with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness, and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients, and in-house counsel. Today is our 13th talk in our online series for this year, 2021. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute legal advice. In the event you do require specific legal advice to your matter, please contact us for a complimentary legal consultation, details of which will be given at the end of this talk. We have three speakers today. Tommy will be speaking on contracts with software developers in terms of use, followed by Hannah, who will be speaking on data privacy and privacy policies. And lastly, followed by Leslie, who will speak on intellectual property rights. We will then conclude with a Q&A session towards the end. Without further ado, allow me to introduce our first speaker, Tommy Wong. Tommy is an associate in the firm's corporate department and graduated from the University of Hertfordshire with first class honours in 2015. Tommy was called to the English Bar in 2017 and thereafter admitted to the High Court of Malaya in 2019. Tommy has experience in corporate and commercial matters, project agreements, franchising, licensing, regulatory compliance and M&As. 
Secondly, allow me to introduce Hannah Patrick, who is a senior associate at the firm. Hannah graduated from the University of Malaya in 2012 and was admitted to both the High Court of Malaya in 2012 and thereafter the High Court of Sabah and Sarawak in 2017. She is experienced in areas of general litigation, construction, debt recovery, and administration of estates. Last but not least, allow me to introduce Leslie Lim, who is a partner at the firm and practices in general, general civil litigation and drafting of corporate and commercial agreements as well as sports law. She was a key team member of the sports law practice group at MWK which won sports law firm of the year award and she's also she was also nominated for women lawyer of the year last year in 2020. If you have any questions please don't forget to post it up on Slido. You can access the Slido page by scanning the QR code which you see on the screen now or going into the Slido website and keying in the number 868568. I'll repeat that 868568. Without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to Tommy, who will take us through contracts with software developers and technology vendors, as well as terms of use for websites and mobile applications. Tommy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cassandra. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, just allow me to quickly share my screen. Okay. Hi, guys. My name is Tommy, and I'll be speaking on contracts with software developers and technology vendors, and also a little bit on uh, end user license agreements and also online terms of use. A software development agreement is a contract between a customer looking to develop a software application and engaging a, develop, a software developer and the software development agreement will set up will set out the terms and conditions under which the, the engagement will be uh, governed. Usually or more commonly development of the software application and or mobile mobile application will entail customizations, um, inspection and testing by, by, by the customer to ensure that the developed software application and or app is to the satisfaction of the customer and also to ensure that the progressive milestones are being met so that the software application or mobile app will meet the goal, goal live date. In terms of development in itself, there will be source codes and intellectual property rights relating to the ownership of such uh, IP in, in question. During this uh, presentation, I'll touch on the key terms and conditions of a software development agreement to look out for. Most importantly, uh, the first thing to, to look out for in, in a software development agreement is the development of the software application or mobile app itself and the progressive milestones uh, supporting such development. It will set out the deliverables and their respective progressive milestones, which will then also entail their respective payments to be made to the vendor by the customer uh, during the whole development of the software and throughout the, the period of the, con the agreement as well. Secondly is the inspection and testing. Uh, this is relevant to the process to ensure that uh, the development of the software application or mobile application uh, throughout its stages uh, functions accordingly, according to the timeline expected for the go live date and also to the full satisfaction of the customer as uh, progressively. We have source codes being involved and also certain IP rights such as software components that involved in the development itself. Uh, it, it's usually set up under intellectual properties whereby the ownership of these um, software components, indip individual software components, source codes, which are also known as text commands, and also certain uh, other certain IP rights could be patented or copyright of the software to be catered for and it will set out the, the, the respective owner or whether such intellectual property will be transferred to the customer. In connection with the progressive milestones and progressive payments, previously I have just mentioned that it is important that the development of the software meets the deadline or the progressive milestones that are attached to each stage. And because there, there will, the agreement will set out an expected timeline for the app or the software to go live, any and almost all, if not all, uh, software development agreements will entail a liquidated ascertained damages clause, also known as LAD, to cater for any event of delay uh, by the vendor in, in the development of the software software application or mobile application in meeting the goal live date. And any delay in achieving the goal live date will be compensated by LAD. The rate of LAD will also be calculated by under the uh, delay and LAD clause in the agreement. Lastly, in, in a software development agreement, not all agreements have this uh, have this clause because support and maintenance could very well be an independent agreement or contract by itself. Um, support and maintenance are very important aspects of software development as a software application or even an, a, a mobile application that has been developed will require constant updates such as its features, its function functionality and the app itself. 
Okay, uh, so I will dive deep deeper into the support and maintenance part of uh, the agreements uh, in the next slide. Because software applications and mobile applications constantly need to be under review and to ensure that it is functioning at full capacity, they will require support and maintenance services to ensure uh, such functionality to the full satisfaction of the customer and or end user. In the event that these support and maintenance services are to be set up in an independent software agreement, the key terms to look out for are uh, as follows. The type of support and maintenance services that will be uh, included in under the agreement. Th these services will come after the installation, integration, and the go, go live date of the software application. Basically, these services come after the launch of, of the software. Secondly, it will, it will provide the service level um, clause, which will set up the type of service level required for the operation, uh, maintenance, and services of the software application. In relation to the service level, uh, service level clause, there will also be a response time set out the efficiency and the timeliness of um, the service provider to respond to queries or issues pertaining to the relevant software application or mobile application one key term to to, to, to know and, and to be mindful of is payments because if in the event it is integrated within the software development agreement, there will be a payment term for the development of the software itself. And subsequently, there will be a different payment term for support and maintenance services because they are, they are both different scope of service or work that are in question. Moving on, after, uh, after, after the launch of a software application or mobile application, these softwares or these applications will be, will be released to the general public to be used, some of which will entail an end user license agreement whereby the application operator will then grant a license to the end user the right to use the, the, the application under uh, the terms of the, agree of the end user license agreement itself. These terms include um, the terms for the download, installation, and use of the software application. Notable apps that have end user license agreements are Zoom, Apple, Adobe, and even some gaming online games as well. It is usually set up right before an end user clicks to agree to download, install, and use the, the application. An example of an online end user license agreement is as set up in the slide by this software called Turnitin. Those of you who are still in college will probably <laughs> see this quite often. Because it is a, a form of a licensing agreement, one of the most important terms to look out for is the grant of license clause, whereby it is stated that the company is granting granting the user with the end user with the right or license to download, install and use the software application and to look out for under such a clause could be a sub clause to, to involve the limitations of the use of the software. So there are restrictions um, in cer certain situations or circumstances that companies would want to restrict uh, users from um, certain users or, or installation or download, such as, for example, I purchase I purchase a software and it is restricted on me that I can only download and use this software within a single purchase for five mobile phones. And IP rights, are, I will not be diving too deep into it because I, Leslie will be touching on this subject um, later on in, in the presentation. Lastly, terms of use, an, agree an online agreement which um, users or visitors of websites will have to agree to before using such a website. It applies to apps as well, such as WhatsApp, Twitter, even Instagram. Now, what are what are some of these terms of use that are uh, important or relevant to, to be con taken into consideration um, upon your perusal of, of the same is the services that involved in, in the website, um, the services that are provided under the website or the app, the clause will actually set out uh, in detail what, what is being provided or offered as a service by the company. Privacy policy is in relation to, because it's online um, and you have to key in data before you, your, your, your personal data before you download or even use an app or website, or even from cookies itself, or from browsers. Um, these privacy policies will set out um, data collection, data storage, data processing, um, so and so forth. And Hannah will be speaking on this uh, matter shortly. Some terms of use provide for a license to use the services of the website and or app due to certain IP rights as well. Uh, something is not contained in all terms of use, but only certain cases or apps 
or websites. And there are limit limitation of liability whereby the company has a limitation of liability to all four damages in relation that arises out of the user's use or download or installation of the website or the app. And this ties in with indemnification whereby if there are any damages arising out of the user's use of the website or app, the user will compensate and hold harmless the website and or app operator slash company against any and all liabilities, damages and losses and expenses. So in conclusion, there are various key terms that are contained in these online or digital agreements that we often overlook. And it is important to keep an eye out and to understand fully the basis and intention behind these clauses before we agree to use, download and install um, these apps or even use the website in, for the matter. I will now pass on the pass the floor on to Hannah. Thank you very much for your time. Hannah, on to you. Thank you, Tommy. Now let me share my screen. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will be introducing data privacy or data protection in Malaysia. The governing act of data protection in Malaysia is the Personal Data Protection Act 2010. Although it it's 2010, it only came into force in November 2013. This act governs the collection, processing, and usage of personal data within certain limitations, uh, which I will discuss after this. Before we go to the limitations, I would like to just introduce some uh, common definitions, uh, common words used, and uh, these are all defined under the PDPA. First is personal data. What is personal data? Personal data is your name, IC, passport number, driver license, birth certificate number, account number, Number, address and handphone numbers. These are details which you are quite used to giving uh, when you go online shopping, for example, or when you travel. However, sensitive personal data is personal data relating to your physical or mental health, health or condition, political opinions and religious beliefs, etc. The term data subjects would be people like you and I who are currently residing in Malaysia. Who are that data users? There are currently 11 class of users and they include financial institutions, telcos, hospitals, insurance companies, and even legal firms like us and who are data processors. These are third party vendors, IT companies or marketing agencies who you hire to process the personal data you have obtained. So if you are a data user, you sometimes either process it within your organization or have a third party do it. So the data processes are these third parties. We now go to the limitation. Now this act, PDPA, only applies to commercial transactions. It is also only for supply or exchange of goods or services, agency investments, banking and insurance. And it does not cover personal data disclosed in non-commercial transactions. And um, living in the modern world, we see a lot of posts on social media. Not all are commercial transactions. Now, those are which are not uh, commercial, they are not covered under the PDA. PDPA. The PDPA also does not include credit reporting business. Credit reporting business would be like a CITOS, if you have uh, hired CITOS before, to uh, to do some credit uh, search. Uh, and it's also data which are processed either solely or partly in Malaysia. Now, this is most important. It does not apply to the federal or state government. We now go to the several, seven uh, governing principles of data protection. Now, before I go to the details, this is the summary which I would like you to take away. First, consent has to be obtained. Adequate notice has to be given. Disclosure to third parties have to be done properly. Data has to be stored for only a period of time and securely. And access must be given to data subject to update or correct the data. So if you are a data user, these are the seven governing principles which you must adhere to. First, the general principle. The general principle is consent by data subject to the processing of personal data. Sensitive personal data can be processed only for the purposes set out in section 40 of PDPA. Now, which is what? There are some examples here that we have written. Medical purposes, for legal advice, matters relating to life, death, of security of data subject. These are considered vital interests under the act which in which person uh, personal data sensitive personal data can be this is something that you may be very familiar these are privacy policies this is something you see on websites on um, on forms maybe so these are written notice in both bm and english okay? notice has to describe the personal data the purpose you collect the data the source of this personal data now this source of personal data can be anything it can be when you enter a premise you register something and you have data there. That is your source. Right to access in the future, how to contact the data user in the future, who will this data be disclosed to, limit the process of 
personal data and whether the supply of data is obligatory or voluntary and if obligatory what are the consequences of failure to provide the personal data okay so this is your written notice this is the second governing principle third is disclosure now earlier you you will see that this part it says who will this data be disclosed so this is in line with the third principle which is disclosure this principle governs the situation where you need to disclose the data for any purpose other than what was stated during the collection so if during the collection, you have already stated, okay, I will disclose this data to group A. But if uh, you wish to disclose this data to uh, group B, this is something additional notice of disclosure you have to give to uh, people who have provided the data to you. Next is the security of data. Data users must take all steps to protect data from loss, misuse, modification, unauthorized or accidental access or disclosure, alteration or destruction. So you are to ensure that data provides processes provide guarantees in respect of technical and organizational security measures and this is very important uh, i will tell you why but uh, what is the takeaway from here is that the data users you have to ensure your data processes can give you the guarantee that whatever data that they will process we will be also be protected and it's secure right um this is because you will see later why uh it's because data users will be the ones who will be sued or brought to court uh, if anything happens to the data or if a data breach happens. Retention. Now, retention is keeping the data. It shall not be kept longer than necessary to fulfill the purpose personal data are collected. It has so once it's you're done with the purpose of why you collect the data, it has to be destroyed or permanently deleted. After that, we will look at data integrity. It goes this goes to the accuracy and uh, completeness of the data. So data users, you are to take reasonable steps to ensure that personal data is accurate, it's complete and not misleading and updated. And for it to be updated, you have to give access to this data. So if you are a data user, you collect data, you must give your data subject uh, the chance to correct the data, right? So it should be given access to his personal data to be able to update or correct said data, except where PDPA says it's unnecessary. All right. So again, that's your seven principles. Consent has to be obtained, adequate notice to be given, disclosure uh, has to be given, data to be stored for a period of time and securely. Access must be given for people to update or correct the data. Now, these are the rights generally um, covered under the PDPA, right to ex right of access to personal data, right to correct personal data that is probably more relevant to that data sub. But the one that I think is uh, more relevant to data users would be if you want to do direct marketing, right? Uh, how do you go about it? Surely that you are allowed to use some data for some form of marketing and advertising, right? So this is the right to prevent processing for purposes of direct marketing. Uh, don't panic yet. It's not like you cannot do at all. There are just certain limitations that are in place. First, you cannot do targeted direct marketing to data subjects unless they agree to. So if you want to use their data for targeted the promotional items, for example. This is where you see websites saying, do you agree to this company giving you promotional items? If they, they tick yes, then that's fine, right? But you cannot just give if they don't give consent. Remember, the first principle is to have is that you have to obtain consent. Number two, uh, data uh, users are permitted to send non-targeted marketing materials to all their customers or to entire categories or types of customers. So if you are sending a proportional item targeted to all of your, your customers, and that's fine. It's not targeted to a certain person or a certain group. Oh, that's clear. Okay, uh, this is where I, I was speaking about security of data earlier. What are the risks of violations? If you violate the PDPA, what will happen? Well, first of all, reputation. You know, people will pick up on it. Things will go viral on social media, which is what happened to one of uh, the examples I'll, I'll tell you later and um, yeah and your, your your company may suffer bad reputation if news of data breach leaks and that's never good you know and uh, but more importantly if there is a proper report made on data breaches you may be fined up to 300,000 or they may be imprisonment of up to two years involved here all right so now I would like to just quickly share three examples of data breaches that have happened in Malaysia okay this the one involving the Malaysian Medical Council happened in 2017 there was an ex expose uh, on a massive data breach where roughly 46.2 million mobile phone users from Malaysian telcos and mobile virtual network operators were leaked online. And uh, apparently the company 
that was allegedly involved has been cleared all charges. We don't know what happened. Um, there is no report on what happened, but uh, they were cleared of all charges. But this data leak happened involving the Malaysian telcos. And then uh, in March this year, Mas had a, there was another report saying that Mas had sent out an email notifying its enriched members that there was a data security incident at one of its third-party uh, IT service providers. So this is where uh, the data processor had a data breach. But in this case, Malaysian Airlines, the data user uh, was in breach. However, there is no evidence that any personal data had been misused. Again, there is not much uh, follow-up. We don't know what actually happened. But see, the point here is that the possibility of uh, data misuse has is out there. It's in the news, right? And this is as uh, recent as one week ago. This one involved RHB Bank. Uh, there were questions raised whether there has been a data breach involving RHB Bank because uh, RHB mail emailed to its customer. There has been an error in e-statements that was sent out previous night due to a technical issue. It is unclear at the moment how many accounts have been affected by the possible data breach. All these are on the news. I'm um, not quoting personal information or confidential information. You can Google them and just read up on what had happened. The takeaway from all these data breaches is that you have to uh, make sure that you monitor your vendors, your data processes. Ultimately, data users are the ones to be brought or prosecuted, to be prosecuted or sued in court, right? So um, the, the part where you have to ensure that secure... Uh, uh, guarantees given by your data processor is very vital, right? If there are any complaints that you would like to make, uh, you can go to the, this is more for the data subjects, you can go to the tribunal to have it compl to complain about your matter. Uh, the regulations are enforced starting this year only, and you can appeal this decision to the court uh, if you are unhappy with the tribunal's decision. This is just uh, good information to have. Finally, I would like to touch on two case laws. Our case laws are scarce and fairly recent. However, there are notable judicial pronouncements, both this year by one judge, one particular judge in Johor Bahru. Uh, first, uh, it's a case where the plaintiff wanted to add a third party into the proceedings. But the court took note of this disclosure principle um, by saying that adding the third party may expose the defendant to a breach of PDPA and dismissed the plaintiff's application. I won't go into detail. I'll just you know tell you what it is and that what has happened. And uh, the second one would be the defendant alleged that they have informed the plaintiff, which is the bank, of a change of address by email. However, the notification was not proper as it did not comply with the loan agreement and the PDPA. Court took note of the security principle and said that in the event of non-compliance, the plaintiff ran the risk of being prosecuted under PDPA. Uh, that's all I have for my presentation. I hope you've uh, learn something uh, about data privacy in Malaysia. Over to you, Leslie. Thank you, Hannah. Um, let me just very quickly share my screen first. Right. Very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Leslie Lim. Uh, and I'll be covering the third segment of today's talk. So I just want to, um, before I start, just draw us back to the topic of today's talk. So today's talk is about the legal aspects of digital transformation. Um, so a lot of our listeners today could possibly be either employees or bosses working in a company, or even individuals that are thinking of uh, bringing their businesses online, or maybe you've already done so. Uh, and so based on my colleagues sharing, from Tommy's sharing, by now, you already know that if you need to enter into contractual relationships with some uh, technology vendors, you already know what are the key terms that you will need to look out for in your contracts. And uh, you'll be well appraised uh, of the principles under data privacy in Malaysia from Hannah's sharing. Um, but the third aspect that I'm going to share for the next 15 minutes or so is on intellectual property rights. So you may have a, a business that's flourishing and, and growing, but a lot of people may not take steps to then protect their brand. So today I'm going to cover IP rights. Uh, so intellectual property, we usually call it IP for short. And I'm going to start off by giving a very general overview of uh, the IP protections that we have in Malaysia. Uh, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, zooming in a little bit more on trademarks. So before I start, uh, I just want to say that uh, my presentation has quite a number of, of pictures uh, and they are for purely for illustration purposes. And the bulk of them were taken from this website called unsplash.com. So it's one of the many photo sites that you have online that provides royalty-free images. So sometimes uh, what we find is that um, clients come to us and they say that uh, they're in a little bit of trouble because they've put out some advertising um, with an image that they've taken from Google. And, they, are, and they, they come to us and they say that, oh, I took this picture from Google. You know, it's available on Google Images. I can't use it. Um, but what they fail to see is there's sometimes a copyright notice attached to these different photos. So that's something to, to keep in mind 
uh, for advertising uh, moving forward for your materials. So a uh, few disclaimers, we don't own or have rights over any of these images. They're all uh, given credit to the relevant sources and they're all quoted uh, at the bottom of my slides. Right, so to kickstart, uh, when we speak about intellectual property and IP, very often we are referring to creations and inventions of the human mind. But what a lot of people don't realize is that IP, although it's intangible, uh, unlike when companies invest in buildings and properties, IP can actually be a very valuable asset uh, for your company. And that's something I hope to demonstrate. Uh, but on an international perspective, uh, IP is governed by this body called WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. And then uh, in Malaysia, IP is administered by this body called MIPO. So in general, we have six IP protections, trademark, copyright, patent, industrial designs, trade secrets, and geographical indications. So the ones that we're going to focus on today is trademark. So what's a trademark? It's basically a logo, um, a sign that differentiates your goods and services from someone else's goods and services. I've given here an example uh, of different aspects from the sports industry. I've picked out some of the most valuable sports brands. So in the first row are sports brands. So you see the logo and uh, the trademark for Nike, ESPN, Adidas, and Gatorade. Then on the middle row, what you have is sports brands. And they also have their own uh, logos, which have been trademarked. Uh, and as much as a lot of people think that Olympics should have topped the list for the most valuable brand, it's in fact the Super Bowl. Um, and then there's, you see the World Cup there as well, Qatar 2022. And on the third row are actually individual athletes who have created their own logo and trademarked them uh, to gain and generate value for themselves. So the first one, you have Roger Federer, then you have Tiger Woods, CR7 is Cristiano Ronaldo. And then the last one, I'm not sure how many people recognize, that's actually LeBron James' personal logo. He purposely did it in the shape of like a castle with a little crown on top uh, to match his Instagram handle, which is King James, actually. So important thing to remember when it comes to trademark is that, have a look at my third point over there, it's in bold. Uh, trademarks are territorial and jurisdictional in nature. So if you've taken steps to protect your trademark here in Malaysia, do not automatically assume that it is protected in Singapore, Thailand, Thailand, Indonesia, etc. in other countries. The protection is only in the country that you have applied for protection. The governing legislations in Malaysia, uh, if you have filed for a trademark uh, before December 2019, that will fall under the Old Trademarks Act 1976. And recently, we had a fairly new act that passed in 2019, uh, which has an enabling provision for the Madrid system. I'm going to cover that slightly later. Uh, but more importantly, again, have a look at the words in poll. Now you can not only trademark a mark, like a, a picture or a logo or a sign, but you can actually trademark things like shape of goods, packaging, color, style, hologram, positioning. So it's really expanded uh, what parties can trademark. Copyrights usually relate to creative works. So here we're talking about, uh, you know, writings in books. Uh, we're talking about songs. It's very important for authors to have their work being protected. We're even referring to things like uh, photos, film, sound recordings as well. Patents are related to inventions. And a subset of uh, patents is actually this uh, utility innovation. So just to give an example to illustrate, uh, usually a party or an inventor would apply for a patent when they have a new... Uh, invention. So you see the pen on the left and perhaps over time uh, the company may have done incremental improvements to the pen and hence you see the pen on the right which is looks much sleeker, it's shinier, it's probably the ink flows a little uh, a lot better and that would be an application under utility innovation. Industrial design uh, relates to features of shape, configuration, pattern or ornament uh, which is applied to an article in an industrial process uh, and very importantly, the finished article must appeal to the eye. So again, I've put some examples. Mini Cooper is one example of an industrial design. The shape of the car is very unique. And on the right, uh, Apple Products uh, is one of the most famous uh, industrial designs. Their lead designer, Sir Jonathan Ive, is one of the leading industrial designers in the world. And uh, all of us know that Apple products have a very distinctive uh, shape, you know, the way you use it, uh, minimalism of it. Geographical indications, uh, usually it's for an application where your product has a certain relationship with the quality, reputation or characteristic that's attributed to a specific geographical location. Uh, so one example is Bentong Ginger. I put there a picture of a ginger. Another example that frequently comes to mind is Sarawak Pepper. Uh, lastly is Trade Secrets. 
So trade secrets usually deal with uh, confidential information. So this is information that's commercially valuable uh, to your company because it, it's secret. Uh, it's maybe what helps your company uh, thrive in the way that it does. And because of its value, it's limited to a, a group of people. And usually companies or parties will take certain steps to protect the information to keep it secret. So that's what uh, trade secrets are. Okay, so I've covered the six main IP protection. And I'd just like to take a minute uh, for you to envision this with me, okay? So for a minute, I just want you to imagine you are an employee of Coca-Cola and your boss comes to you and says that, okay, we've got this new product. We need to do something to protect it because I think we're going to make millions of dollars from it, okay? I'd like you to share with me which of the six IP protection do you think that you can uh, utilize or apply to protect this product that you can answer to your boss, okay? So at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat box, okay? You can just click on it uh, and, and write down which aspect of the bottle you would like to protect or you want to recommend to your boss to protect and which IP protection you think will be applicable uh, to protect that part of the bottle. So I'm just going to let this run for a minute and can everybody find the chat button at the bottom? Great, uh, I've got an answer from Shazin. She says, protect the color, protect the font. And which of the six IP protection would you use for that, Shazin? Trade secret, Kenneth, word, copyright, great. The answers are coming in, Nadia. Trademark the name, Peyton. Trade secrets, trademark patent, bottle design, great. Now, this is also a way for me to, to see if everybody's paying attention to what I've been saying. Bottle shape, great. Thanks, Sarah. Dr. Amy says the red background, interesting choice. Okay, I'm just going to let this go for another 15 seconds. Industrial design, okay, just five more seconds. Any more? Okay, I'm just going to reveal the answer. Bottle cap, wow, that's a first. Interesting. Right, so here, have a look at the slides. So very important, the formula, probably want to protect uh, under trade secrets. Uh, apparently, Coca-Cola used to protect their trade secret, uh, their recipe in a vault in their headquarters. Sources say that it's now been moved to the Coca-Cola Museum. I, I don't know how true that is. You can trademark the brand, that Coca-Cola word, on the bottle. You can also copyright the packaging art. So the last one is the bottle shape. Someone said bottle shape as well. The bottle shape under the previous legislation, you only industrial design may have been available to protect the bottle shape. But now under the new Trademarks Act 2019, it is potentially possible to uh, trademark the, the shape of the bottle as well. So I wanted to use this example to just illustrate that very often sometimes parties think that I only can use one IP protection to protect my product or my services. But the reality is that there are these six and you can uh, actually activate more than one to protect your products and services. Okay, Here's another example given by WIPO. If you have a website, again, you can see on the left the different types of protections that are available to protect on the right the different elements of your website. So you can protect your software, you can protect your uh, logos, you can protect your web page, graphic symbols, etc. Okay, now I'm going to dive into the Trademarks Act. So the Act does provide... Uh, a definition, uh, as I mentioned just now, it's a sign that graphically distinguishes one pa one party's products from another. And the act uh, actually lists out what is registrable and what is not registrable. So registrable is when the mark is distinguishable. Uh, it can be a signature, it can be a name. In fact, it can be really, really wide. Uh, and it's really up to the parties how creative they want to be to distinguish their, their mark. Uh, but what's not registrable, uh, and very often uh, applications are sometimes rejected because of this, is when the mark is likely to cause confusion. Uh, it's identical to a mark that has already been registered or it's well known already for something else. And trademark protections are for 10 years uh, and every renewal is for 10 years after that. Okay? So before embarking into the trademark process, uh, we, we usually advise our clients to also do spend some time on the conceptualization process. That's where you, you sit down and think like, okay, what, how do I want my, my brand to be represented in the public? Most importantly, we want to comply with the Trademarks Act to ensure that it's distinctive and unique. Another example I've given here is you can see how uh, McDonald's logo has just evolved over the last 40 to 60 years. And you can see the amount of thought that's been put into conceptualizing their, their logo and their brand as it evolves over the years. Okay. And then I've taken this snapshot from uh, the McDonald's US website where you can see the middle paragraph. They said, we spent 50 years developing McDonald's trademark and logos and they are part of our brand and consistency. You know, we, we understand you may want to use our trademark for certain reasons. Here, fill in the form, let us know why. 
uh, and will consider your request. So this is an example of trademarks uh, being used by a, a big company that's well known to all of us. So once you've conceptualized your mark, the next step is to determine uh, which class do you want to protect it in. So under the NIS agreement, there are over 45 classes uh, that are available for uh, your choice. So I've listed here some of the key ones just to illustrate uh, how wide the different classes are. So uh, for example, if you look on the far right, if, if you're a company like Nike maybe, which produces shoes and bags and shirts and a whole variety of sporting articles, you may want to register under class 25 because that's got clothing, footwear and headwear. But you may also want to apply under class 28, which covers sporting articles as well. Many uh, other classes that relate to the F&B industry as well, food and beverage, we've even got telecommunications class 38, and then class 41 uh, for education as well. The trademark registration process. So once you've conceptualized, you know what your mark looks like, uh, you've identified the different classes that you want to, to protect your mark in, uh, you can submit the application. This is a process that we usually uh, assist our clients with. Submit the application manually online, application received, then MIPO will conduct an examination to first see if the statutory requirements have been fulfilled. If not fulfilled, there'll be a, a provisional refusal, and then you have a chance to sort of fix your application. But if all the statutory requirements are fulfilled, it will move on to substantive examination. If you pass, and then it will then be gazetted uh, in the uh, Intellectual Property Officials Journal. So this is almost like a public gazette. And so if there are interested parties who are concerned that there may be marks out there that are similar to theirs, this will be the, the gazette and the journal that they will go through. And if they find that, oh, there's this new party that's putting in a logo or a mark that's similar to mine, I may want to file an opposition proceeding. Uh, and that's when you will need to go through the proceedings to try and argue that it's actually unique and distinctive. And if all good, no opposition or, you know, uh, you can proceed to register your trademark. Right. So as your company uh, grows, there is a possibility you may also want to think of expanding beyond Malaysia. So if you recall just now, I emphasized the fact that trademark protection is territorial and jurisdictional in nature. So if you want to expand beyond Malaysia, there's three different routes you could take. You could take the national route, which is I apply in Malaysia and then I decide I want to apply in Singapore. So you go to Singapore and then you find an equivalent of Leslie over there. And then you have to go through this whole process again, uh, filing the application, da 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 uh, potentially apply for a translator. for If you want to go to countries like uh, Thailand, you may need a translator. So you end up paying multiple times of the fees. You can also potentially take a regional route, but the regional route is in examples like in the EU. So under the EU Intellectual Property Office, uh, they have a system where you can uh, file once and then your mark will be protected throughout basically. Unfortunately, we don't have such system here uh, in Malaysia or in Southeast Asia region. Then comes the international route, which is the Madrid system that I wanted to share about. So if you can see on the top was the example I gave just now. So you have come up with this very, very nice burger. You've developed it. It's well known in Malaysia. And now you want to expand it beyond Malaysia. And you're thinking of Australia, China, Japan and Spain. And if you go to each of the individual countries, again, you're going to end up finding different representatives filing, uh, paying different filing fees, and then you're going to need to get it translated into Chinese, Japanese and Spanish as well. But if you go through the Madrid system, you apply first here in Malaysia, MIPO will then send it to WIPO, who will then help to assist with the uh, application process in all the other four countries. Uh, so this is really helpful uh, because what, what will happen then is through the Madrid system, you only need to have one centralized uh, filing and management system. So you only need to deal with uh, MIPO. Uh, you only need to deal with one renewal date. You only need to pay one set of fees, one set of translation. Uh, you only need to have one representative. So it's very convenient in that sense. Uh, and in fact, I think uh, SMEs stand to benefit the most uh, because uh, it's convenient and it saves cost. My last a couple of points, okay. What are the advantages of registering a trademark? The most important is that you will get exclusivity over that mark. You can stop other people from using their mark if they uh, use it without your permission. Uh, and then from there, through the exclusivity, you have the right to assign, to license, or to franchise. I think Tommy touched on this uh, a little bit in his uh, session just now. So through that, when you license and you assign and you franchise, your company stands to generate commercial value and financial gains. Also, that mark will then be attached to uh, goodwill and reputation of your brand, of your products, of your services. Parties are able to, uh, I, public is are able to identify, you know, there's a reason why all of us choose uh, Apple or Samsung. There's a reason why some of us choose Nike over Adidas. Uh, it's that product quality 
quality that is associated with that brand. You'll be able to use the uh, R symbol. Uh, you have protection for 10 years. So you invest and go through the process once and you're set for the next 10 years. And as I mentioned earlier, we are creating assets that could potentially generate value for us. Okay. So with an unregistered trademark, um, you only can use TM. Uh, when you register, you can use the R mark. You know, and then you can then, as I said just now, um, license and franchise it out. Okay. So these are, again, just samples of brands that have grown over the years. Amazon is the most valuable valuable brand in the world 20, in 2020. Uh, they had 220 million. Then you see Google, Apple, Microsoft, a lot of tech companies up there. But I'm going to bring it back closer to home where you see in 2020, the top brand in Malaysia was Petronas. Then you have Maybank, Gunting, Tanaga National, a lot of GLCs up there. And one last example is the teapot trademark. Uh, so this creamer, I'm sure it's familiar to all of us when we drink our teh tarik. It's uh, a, a brand and a product that's been grown by FNN over the years. And then a couple of years back, they decided to sell it and they actually sold it for 83.17 million. So this is just to again demonstrate a uh, value of registering a trademark. My last couple of points uh, to wrap up. Intellectual property is intended to promote uh, creativity and innovation of the human mind. It will hopefully improve competition and generate jobs, it can be of great value to individuals and companies uh, and it's also important to find the right intellectual property protection for your company products and your services. So I hope that's been helpful. Uh, I'm just going to pass the time back to Cassandra, who is going to run the Q&A session for us. Yep. Thanks so much, Leslie. Okay, we will now take questions from participants from Slido. Um, and I think we have quite a few. If you've forgotten to post your questions, please kindly access the Slido page and key in the number 868-568 if you'd like to post any of your questions now. So without further ado, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the Slido questions and I'm just going to share um, the Slido page so you guys can see it. So I believe the first question goes to Hannah. Um, the question is, recently many cloud softwares such as payroll does companies um, I think the question here was just company needs liable but I think the question is is the company liable if there is a data leak and how do we prevent this how do you prevent payroll clerks from copying and leaking such data first of all I will address the how okay the law doesn't say how you can do it the law just says you have to adhere to the act and if uh, there is anything that is in breach, uh, then you will have to uh, have it reported to the relevant bodies. Uh, I suppose the best practice is always to have your privacy policies up. But this is uh, in regards to our employer and employee relationship. So if you want to ensure that the security of your data is uh, uh, is protected, I would suggest, highly suggest that you, I suppose, get a very reliable data security company or IT security company who can uh, protect the company. But if we're Talking about the law, the law is there for you to to say that uh, there are other laws other than PDPA to protect the relationship between, to govern the relationship, sorry, between an employer and an employee, uh, which is not covered under this talk. But uh, obviously, you can report the employee to the police. And will the company be liable? If I don't have many facts to go on here, but it may, yes, it may be. Uh, they may be liable. The certain acts, uh, certain sections or provisions in the PDPA. Okay, thanks, Hannah. Um, the second question that we have, I think, goes to Tommy, and that question is: How are end-user license agreements legally enforceable, given that users in general rarely read the terms of use and onerous terms are not brought to attention? Thanks, Cassandra. Um, in terms of end-user license agreements, as I mentioned earlier, they are usually displayed right before a user proceeds to download and install and use um, the soft the relevant software now there will generally and always be a tick box whereby the users will have to click to acknowledge and agree that they have read all terms under the end user license agreement now the end user license agreement is typically protecting the licensor which is the company providing the end user with the right to use the, the software application now and it is the end user's responsibility to peruse the end user license agreement and the terms and conditions contained therein so to use a basis that users generally don't read the terms of use and terms or relevant terms are not brought to their attention is not reasonable um, because ultimately end users will have to understand, acknowledge and agree to the terms, whatever, whether relevant or irrelevant that are contained in the end user license agreement before they can proceed to use, download or install the, the software application. Thanks, Tommy. Um, I think the remainder, if I'm not mistaken, the remainder of the question goes to Leslie. Um, the first question is, Leslie, 
says the will Coca-Cola need to register every intellectual property in the example you've given? Well, I, I can't answer on behalf of Coca-Cola. Uh, I wish I was their lawyer. You know, for a company of that size, I do think that they would have taken uh, all reasonable steps to protect, you know, every aspect possible uh, for, their, for their product. So that example was actually to, to illustrate to our listeners that there are steps that you can take to protect your product. And don't get hung over the fact that you may only have one way to protect it. There are many different ways to protect it. That was the, actually the purpose of that, that example just now. I, I hope that helps. Okay, great. And another question is, how much is the registration fees in Malaysia? And how long does it take for registration process estimated? And I'm assuming this is in relation to intellectual property processes. Um, I'm going to assume that this question relates to the trademark registration process, since that's what I covered in, in my slides. Uh, the registration fees, uh, it, it really depends. Uh, it, it depends on whether sometimes clients want us to start off with a search. So that's one fee. And then there's the whole process as you go along. And then depending on whether there's opposition proceedings. So the fee can be quite a range. Um, so if, I don't know if it's, this is Mr. or Mrs. Anonymous, if you have a specific um, request, you can drop us an email. Uh, we'd be happy to drop you a, a quotation uh, on this. In terms of how long does it take, it can take anywhere from within a couple of months to uh, even up to two years sometimes because uh, sometimes when we submit it, it, it lies in the hands of MIPO um, and that's not within our control. And, and now, of course, with the with the lockdown and everything, I do think uh, these processes are somewhat affected. Since we're on, Leslie, um, I am conscious there is another question which is, um, that people want answered, but I'll just finish off with Leslie first. Um, the next question is, how to prove content belongs to us? Example, in a video or images without watermarks. Are the, then the video or images is found on an online marketplace posted by unauthorized vendors. So I'm assuming the, the question is here without video images being watermarked, how do you protect? Them? Okay. Um, Kes, sorry, could you read it together? I saw one question on social media. I just want to see if I can take it together. It might be yep. interrelated. Um, the question is how do you protect images posted on Instagram, social media, website from unauthorized reuse? Okay. Um, these two questions are quite interrelated. So when we uh, deal with uh, photos and videos, uh, if you recall in my slide just now, this relates to copyright protection. It's original works. So actually, copyright protection is automatic in nature. So unlike trademarks where, you know, I, I went through the whole registration process just now, you don't need to go through a whole registration process for copyright. Uh, copyright is actually automatic. So in the um, in the older days, what, what people used to do is they would, um, if they, they wrote a song and then they would, they would put it into manuscript, they put it in an envelope and then they will mail it back to themselves in a sealed envelope. So then the envelope with the date of the postage becomes proof that they are the owner of it and that was the date of creation, so to speak. But of course, times have modernized, you know, WIPO has come up with systems and now what you can actually do is you can actually lodge a copyright notification uh, with the uh, MIPO, okay? So first of all is to ensure and prove that you are the owner. So if you want to go around and tell people, hey, you can't post this, you can't post this video, you can't post this thing, you can't use my image, you first need to establish that you are the owner of that particular piece of work first. Um, so I, I hope that helps to address that question. Okay, and the last question that we have, um, which I'm conscious we will take together with another question that we had from the chat. Uh, the question from the chat, it was in relation, was from Abdul Shukor, and the question was, when is ASEAN going to have a regional system? And the question here on Slido is, uh, from the top, trademark is territorial and jurisdictional in nature. Does that mean that trademark such as CR7 has registered its trademark internationally? Okay, I'll answer uh, Shukor, Anche Shukor's question first. When is ASEAN going to have a regional system? So you're very sharp. As the example I pointed out just now is uh, Europe and they have their regional system. So what we have over here now is the Madrid system that I shared just now. And the good news is that all ASEAN countries have signed up uh, under the convention to be under the Madrid system, except I think for Myanmar, if I'm not mistaken. So if you want to expand your business beyond Malaysia in the ASEAN region, uh, the Madrid system is uh, one way to consider. Uh, as for... Uh, the football fan here for, for CR7. So when, when you're growing a brand like this and, and you're concerned that uh, you want to protect it in other countries, I think Cristiano would have uh, potentially asked his agent or his lawyers to go and do the necessary in the different countries. 
So actually, there are football clubs, particularly the bigger ones, uh, like Manchester United, Manchester City, um, Chelsea. They have taken steps to protect in almost uh, every country, actually. Okay, great. I think we try and squeeze in the last question here. Um, there's a question which relates to trademark registration and maintenance. How do we trace the date of first use for consumer goods and what amounts to a date of first use? The easiest way would be to register your trademark because once you have a certificate of registration in hand, it's a solid proof that you are the owner of the trademark. And there's, there's very little ways to contest that. But when you have an unregistered trademark, then you're going to have to rely on a lot of different facts and circumstances to try and prove that you are indeed the first user uh, of that mark. So you're going to maybe have to take out like this newspaper clipping to show that your shop set up in 1967. You're going to have to uh, show photos that you took together with someone at that time and you're holding the product in hand. So that you may have to rely on all this extra and, and it's not certain. It's arguable. It's subjective as compared to when you have a certificate in hand and it's like this trademark belongs to me as of this day. So um, that was why a portion of, of the talk was uh, geared towards uh, the importance and the advantages of registration. Great. Um, that's about questions that we have. In the event anyone else has any other questions, feel free to, you can always drop us um, a mail or an email with your questions and we'll be happy to answer them accordingly. Thank you so much to Leslie, Hannah and Tommy for your insights, which has been very helpful today. Before we conclude, um, bear with me for a couple of minutes. I do have a few of my announcements to make. We have provided the link previously to uh, other talks that we have done, which is a little bit more detail into the topics that are related to digital transformation. And these include digital technology agreements, uh, data privacy in Malaysia, and trademarks and international uh, property protection. We've previously done these talks, they're all available online on our website. So feel free to go onto our website and, and the details on our YouTube as well will be there and you have access to those full talks. Um, please join us again for upcoming talks, which we will have. The next one is on the 30th of June, which is small estate distribution for Muslims. And that talk will be given by our partner, Sarah Kambali and our legal associate, Anis. And on the 9th of July, we have another talk, which is on the probate and administration of estates that will be given by Priscilla and Carmen. Secondly, please fill in our feedback for and tell us what you thought of our talk. The link of the forum will be posted in the chat. And thirdly, do follow or like us on our social media accounts. Our handles can be seen on the screen now. And fourthly, if you would like to speak with our lawyers, we do offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the telephone or over video conferencing. Now it's online meetings. Please fill in the form on our website and the link is also posted in the chat box below. Lastly, to our guests, thank you very much for joining us. We hope you have found today's session very informative and useful. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks everyone. Thank you.